at the tender age of two, I fell in love with the universe. I was just like any other baby you'd meet because I would cry all day long, even because of the most insignificant of things. If I was even a little bit hungry, I would start crying. If I needed my diaper changed, I would start crying. If the llama at the zoo ate the candy that I had in my hand, I would start crying. But my mother had one trick, one very special trick. Whenever I started to become fussy, she would take me over to my bedroom window and point to the heavens. See those twinkling stars over there? See that big round moon shining down on us? And I would stop crying. You see, even before I had the ability to form complete sentences, I had already developed a deep appreciation for what lay beyond our home planet. I was already starting to dream big. Throughout my childhood, I was never really focused on the simple and material thing, so to speak. My mission was simple. I wanted to see what was really out there, billions of miles away from us in the final frontier. Now that was a big dream. Unfortunately, there weren't many opportunities available for me at the time. Discovering planets outside of our solar system is expensive and requires a tremendous amount of effort. I never lost hope, though. Many nights, I would just look out at my bedroom window at the stars and dream about how maybe, just maybe, there were hidden treasures out there, possibly teeming with life, just waiting to be found. Things changed for me as I grew older. That was when I watched the movie Interstellar for the first time. And surprisingly, I wasn't really intrigued by the fact that Joseph Cooper managed to end up in a black hole without dying, or that endurance is possibly the coolest spaceship out there. Rather, I became fascinated by the depictions of potentially habitable exoplanets. The observable universe has approximately one billion trillion stars, which, if you think about it, is a really big number. That's about five to 10 times more than the number of grains of sand on all of Earth's beaches combined, which is also a really big number. <laughs> With so many stars out there, I thought, what will it take before we finally find a planet that is not only habitable, but also within a close enough distance such that we may travel to it one day? And in my freshman year of high school, I was able to fulfill this dream. But before I tell you the story of, of how I discovered exoplanets, we're going to play a game first. I'm going to say a word, and you're going to think of the first thing that comes to mind when you hear that word, all right? It could be an impression, an image, anything, really. The word is marvels, M-A-R-V-E-L-S. <laughs> so for many of you, when you hear the word marvels, your first thought might be Spider-Man. However, in my world, Marvels is actually an acronym, not a superhero. That stands for Multi-Object APO Radial Velocity Exoplanet Large Area Survey. <laughs> now that's certainly a mouthful. That's why we go with Marvels. Marvels is certainly not an opportunity to help Spider-Man gain more amazing superpowers, though I'm sure that would have been an amazing research project. However, it was actually a radial velocity survey that looked at more than 5,500 stars over a period of four years to see if objects orbiting them, we call them stellar companions, could be found. Now, Marvels tried to discover three main types of stellar companions, giant planets, brown dwarfs, and binary stars. However, we didn't just point the telescope at the sky and hope that we would see a planet. Rather, we looked at the stars themselves using a technique called the radial velocity method. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up in elementary school, my class would always split up into various groups and play tug of war all the time. Now, imagine that you and one of your best buddies, just the two of you, are playing a game of tug of war. Both of you are going to be tugging at each other through the rope, yet no one really seems to be gaining an advantage because you're both tugging with equal force. Now, imagine that the two of you are standing on a merry-go-round. Both of you are still tugging at each other through the rope, except now the merry-go-round is spinning both of you. Now let's assume that there's a teacher standing a couple of feet away off to the side. She can see that both of you are spinning on the merry-go-round, tugging at each other through the rope. Now here's the interesting part. She can see that the bigger one of you two, whomever that may be, is not standing stationary. Rather, because both of you are standing on the merry-go-round, spinning 
around each other, akin to how binary stars orbit each other, she can see that the bigger person is in a periodic cycle of getting closer and moving away, right? That's how the radial velocity method works. If a star has an object orbiting around it, then both objects are playing a gravitational game of tug of war, meaning that neither object stays completely stationary from our point of view. From our vantage point, we can see the wobble inflicted by the smaller companion, in this case a planet, onto the larger star, and that's how we know if something is there. Through measuring the wobble of stars observed by Marvels, we detected nine giant planets, one brown dwarf, and three new binary stars. But wait, the fun doesn't stop there. <laughs> so now let's assume that a third person wants to play tug of war. Well, we're gonna have to take a separate rope and attach him to the original game of tug of war. This third person is gonna inflict his own gravitational force onto the two other people originally in the system. How would a more complicated situation like that one that allows us to predict the individual motions of stellar companions interacting with each other gravitationally be visualized. Well, suppose that we know the orbital parameters of at least two of the objects in the system. Then, the radial velocity signatures of the third object can be isolated as they should be fairly obvious. See, this third object is going to cause its own wobble onto the two parent stars. And this effect, although in many cases very minimal, can be detected. I was sifting through radial velocity data from Marvel stars when I noticed something very odd. From the data filtered out from this binary star, there were some extremely unusual signatures. Let's see if you can find them. <laughs> For many of you, this might just look like points on a graph. But look here. Wow. As you can see in this very bottom plot, you can see a trend that looks like a sine wave. And what this trend is telling us is that it's showing us the pattern of the wobble of the parent star, which is the more massive star. It's showing us that the parent star is going in a periodic cycle of moving towards us, going away from us, and so on. It repeats that cycle. Based on other observations collected from the system, we have concluded that this object that's causing the wobble of the parent star, whatever it may be, is most likely a giant planet. And here, you see the giant planet revolving around the two binary stars. This is a circumbinary system, and as you can see, the two binary stars are revolving around the center of mass of the entire system. We call this center the barycenter. The circumbinary planet orbits around this point as well, though as you can see, its orbit is spaced out much further compared to the orbit of the two parent stars. Data indicates that the binary system orbits at a period of 42 days, while the planet's signatures indicate a period of just under 400 days and a mass of three times the mass of Jupiter. In other words, this is a true P-type circumbinary system in which the planet orbits strictly outside of the orbit of the two parent stars. Doesn't it remind you of the planet Tatooine, Luke Skywalker's home from Star Wars? <laughs> it orbits around a binary star system too, though as you can see, if you walk out onto the surface of Tatooine, you're gonna see two suns in the sky. Although many studies have explored using radial velocity to detect such circumbinary planets, this is the first solid detection of such a world. Initial results from the Marvel survey are very promising. The discovery of this circumbinary planet has effectively proved that modern radial velocity instruments have the capabilities to tease out a planet's orbital parameters and configuration even within the chaotic environment of a binary star system. So, what's the next step? Well, first, let's backtrack to the tug of war scenario. Imagine that the person on the opposite end of the rope is someone much weaker than you. He or she will thus inflict a force that is very small in magnitude. The same is true for terrestrial planets. Because these are much less massive than giant planets, it is quite difficult to detect them due to the smaller gravitational force that they inflict on the parent stars. The smaller gravitational force means that it's gonna be quite difficult to find a planet it's because the wobble is gonna be so much smaller. Let's take our solar system for an, as an example. The Earth inflicts only about 0.1 meters per second of radial velocity change onto the sun. Fortunately, as instruments become more and more powerful and techniques become more and more precise, hopefully 
we'll be able to detect more of these minuscule perturbations within the star's orbit. The goal of humanity has long been to maintain the existence of life throughout the future. Despite this, however, the quality of the environment we lived in has degraded over the past several decades. Cities are becoming shrouded in industrial smog. Water levels are rising uncontrollably. And extreme weather plagues remote areas. For many, the only approach by which humans can ensure the preservation of life is to become an interplanetary species. And we are already one step closer towards achieving that goal. Through many recent planetary surveys, it has been found that an increasing number of exoplanets lie within the habitable or Goldilocks zone of their parent stars. Why do we call it the Goldilocks zone? Well, the temperature range experienced by planets in this zone is just right for the existence of liquid water on their surfaces. And liquid water is a crucial catalyst to the thriving of life. As you can see here, this green zone is exactly the Goldilocks zone. On the dartboard of the universe, this is the bullseye that we are aiming for. Given the immense size of our universe, it is probably only a matter of time before humans find an exoplanet that is not only habitable, but also or orbiting very close to our solar system, such that we may travel to it one day. So what are the implications of the discovery of the circumbinary planet? Well, first and foremost, it points to the conclusion that many rare stellar systems exist within our universe, yet have been left undetected by humans. Fortunately, current public exoplanet hunting efforts, which essentially allows anyone with access to a computer to analyze data coming in from observatories to see if extrasolar planets could be detected, are gaining in popularity. As this collective effort expands, maybe someone sitting in the theater today will reveal humanity's second home to us. You know, when I first started dreaming about discovering extrasolar planets, many thought I was joking. In fact, many adults that I trusted thought I was going through a phase that I would eventually outgrow. <laughs> but despite what other people might say and think about you, it's always OK to have wild dreams. Because even though it might seem like they're far out of reach today, they might become reality tomorrow. You will be able to solve the problems the world faces every day if you have the ability to imagine, dream, and actively propose new ideas to society. Furthermore, there's nothing wrong with taking risks, because even though it might seem like there's a 99% chance of failure, the key to solving ancient mysteries might just lie in that 1%. As long as we all have a willingness to work hard for what we believe in, there is nothing that humankind cannot accomplish. And having dreams is the key to making that happen. My dream started when I was two years old. I want everybody in this audience right now, just take a moment, just taking your thoughts, formulate dreams of your own, and leave the theater today knowing that you have the potential to change the world, regardless of race, religion, gender, or age. The future relies on our collective power. I told you in the beginning that when I was two years old, I fell in love with the universe. Now that I'm at the ripe old age of 16, <laughs> my love for the universe has only deepened. What I wish for each and every one of you is to kindle your love for what this amazing universe has to offer. Thank you.